First off, I want to say thanks to your culture and especially Rebecca for organizing this amazing conference. And um, there's been a lot of really incredible resonances already today with some of the things I'm going to be talking about, especially with Dr. Brown's keynote and some of the things in the last session um, on the voice and everything. Um, so title of the talk is Notes Towards Xenomogrification, and I'm going to try and explain what I mean by that term. Um, but I do want to give a general content note ahead of time that um, given one of the books that um, is under discussion today, there will be mentions of rape and sexual assault during this talk, but there will be no explicit um, excerpts um, read from the book. So this presentation is about work of mine that is part of a new project called the Xenology Notebooks, a transdisciplinary transmedia corpus involving the practices of scholarly text, poetics, event scores, composed music, computer code, and new media art installations that expansively considers the Xeno. I presented some early parts of this project at last year's Tuning Speculation, and over the past year have been exhibiting new works dealing with our relationship with the satellites, space probes, and extraterrestrial entities more broadly. I've been thinking here about transdisciplinarity through the work of Felix Guattari and Chaos of Moses, as well as Gary Janosko's elaboration on Guattari's methodology. I'm also thinking about the prefix trans within the growing corpus of trans studies, drawing, of course, upon early texts by key early interlocutors such as Sandy Stone and Susan Stryker, as well as more recent authors such as Paul Preciado, Misha Cardenas, and Ava Hayward. In a recent issue of TSQ having to do with the keywords for trans studies, Jian Chen and Lizette Olivares write that transmedia has the potential to, quote, jolt, jolt us out of sensory alienation. As the title suggests, these are notes. They are offerings for thought, concepts in the making, and the material that I'm writing about is pulling me towards disciplinary domains in which I have little formal training. There will be a lot of flailing about while I attempt to get my foot in, but in the spirit of a transdisciplinarity, let's follow the transversal mo movements that through their motion develop new constellations of theory practice. Mm -hmm. On the Xeno. In our time of reprehensible xenophobia, of course, literally, the fear of the guest, stranger, or foreigner, it behooves us to spend some time near this prefix and the different but related prefix exo, meaning without. These prefixes modify our linguistic milieus and, as I will begin to argue in this presentation, present possible incantations for moments presently unknown to us. Xenology, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is the, quote, scientific study of extraterrestrial phenomena, especially xenobiology. The OED definition references the science fiction writing of Robert Heinlein, as well as an intriguing 1983 letter to the editor of the Nature Journal by Robert A. Freitas Jr., who would go on to become famous for his work in nanomedicine. Freitas notes that the, quote, fields of extraterrestrial life, extrasolar planets, origin of life, theoretical biology, interstellar travel and communication, extraterrestrial intelligence and civilization, and SETI have no generally accepted collective nomenclature, end quote. He notes the general unsuitability of various possible formulations, finally ending on exology or xenology. The, xeno, the xeno prefix, of course, implies strangeness, foreignness, and emphasize the, quote, unfamiliar or foreign regardless of physical location, end quote. Xenology it is. While neither xenology nor exology has necessarily caught on, it feels right to reactivate the term, not only in Freitas' sense, but also in an expanded one that takes on both the study of how people or entities made strain, are made strange as a means of dismissing them or removing them from the concern of a human, as well as studying and fabricating the techniques for how we can make ourselves strange in order to counter forms of alienation. The second processual sense, the making of ourselves strange, I want to specifically term xenomogrification, and I'll go into why later in the presentation. Eva Hayward recently coined the combinatoric tongue-tying word transxenoestrogenesis to describe the complicated practices of estrogen-based hormone replacement therapy and described it as a, quote, purposely unmetabolizable term, which I think is a gorgeous turn of phrase. I feel as if xenomogrification feels somewhat analogous, yet for me, the vibrations tumble pleasantly out of the mouth, even as the neologism itself conjures the gross and vulgar, unauspicious conjoining. Excursus, excursus on the trans voice. Well, philosophical ruminations on the voice from Jacques Derrida to Mladen Dolar and Adriana Cavarero 
have demonstrated the assumption that a voice is uniquely and primarily linked to a singular body. In our daily existence, others rely on that very assumption to manage social situations. The vibrations that escape from our mouths might modulate from day to day, from sickness to health, yet we have an incredible ability to mark particular voices as belonging to particular people. Yet for many, the rumbling graininess of one's voice is itself strange and in need of transformation. Trans men who decide to start hormone replacement therapy can look forward to the deepening of the voice as testosterone works to lengthen their vocal cords. Trans women who take hormones are not as lucky. Once infected by testosterone in puberty, our vocal cords remain long and thick, permanently forcing the pitch of our voice lower. So what is the trans woman to do if she or they desire to raise their voice into a more feminine range, to move into what can be called their trans voice? They must undergo an arduous regimen of vocal training that slowly works to raise not only the pitch of the voice, but also works to change how the voice resonates in the body. Rather than coming deep from the chest, one tries to make the voice resonate more from the mouth. While one can work with professional vocal co coaches to retrain the voice, many trans women follow tutorials posted by others on YouTube or Reddit and practice their, collection, their voice on collections of pre-written texts, including one term, the Harvard Sentences from the 1950s. And I'm actually using that as a source text for a composition entitled Nudge Gently But Wake Her Now that will be, pre that will be premiered next weekend. The training of the trans voice is, of course, taxing on the vocal cords and must be done slowly over the course of months and years to prevent damage. At a certain point, however, some trans women report that they find it difficult to speak at their so-called natural lower pitch of their vocal cords. And in fact, it is the new higher pitch that is their now natural voice. The transformation is complete. Their voice has been xenomogrified. The strangeness here is twofold. The root strangeness of a disconnect between the sound of one's voice and the desired form of self-presentation and the simultaneous strangeness of a society where such transformations often occur only temporarily within theater or film. Like the mystery that surrounds the trans person's ability to pass, many trans women's trans voices will never completely pass as cis feminine. And what's worse, trans women who decide to change their voice, among other practices of self-feminization and body modification, are all too often accused by a certain subset of so-called radical feminists, TERFs, as perpetuating patriarchal stereotypes. Julie Serrano has written about this degradation and critique of the trans feminine extensively in her book, Whipping Girl, terming it trans misogyny. Our trans voices rub against the desires of a cis-normative society, yet they also show the extent to which that which we feel so unique, our voice, is itself something that can be modified into a beautiful, grotesque manifestation of our desires and needs. Xenomogrification is a way to deal with the alienation we feel in our own bodies. Xenomogrification as disalienation. The author Supervert is something of an enigma. No known images exist of him. All of his books are self-published, and once they are sold out, they are not reprinted. Supervert seems to get a perverse pleasure out of tormenting his readers. And indeed, he states that he wants the reader to suffer alongside him, the suffering, tortured writer. Supervert's writing may have remained ensconced in the networked underground, only to be shared through links to his website or the hushed passing of his books from one hand to the other, but his writing has entered the broader cultural environment through the reading from one of his books, Necrophilia Variations, by the author, blogger, aerialist, and porn actress Stoya in the popular hysterical literature's reading series on YouTube, and this video has 24 million views at last count, where women read from their favorite text while being distracted underneath the table by a Hitachi vibrator. Stoya's recent collection of writing, entitled Philosophy, Pussycats, and Porn, contains an open letter to Supervert in which he writes that, quote, Supervert is an object, a brand, an entity that stands completely independent of the person who created it. His book, Extraterrestrial Sex Fetish from 2001, is a rather maddening read and is not a book that I would recommend to those who want to avoid intense and graphic de depictions of rape, sexual assault, and body mutilation. All of these activities occur with both humans and extraterrestrials. It is an attempt to be transgressive in the style of Georges Bataille's Story of the Eye or the works of the Marquis de Sade and succeeds insofar as one often has to fight off feelings of revulsion and manifest bodily discomfort while reading the text. The main character of the book, one Mercury de Sade, is a 30-something white computer programmer affiliated with exophilia, or a fetish for having sex with aliens. The book is structured as a set of four mathematical sets, 
each having 24 elements or chapters <laughs> corresponding to the 24 characters of the Greek alphabet. The four sets have to do with four aspects or factors related to Desaad's exophilia. Oops. The first, alien sex scenes, which are pornographic depictions of exophilia and are imaginations of Desaad's desires coming to fruition. Methods of deterrestrialization, which, which are depictions of Desaad's frustrated attempts to forcibly alienate kidnapped teenage girls, or what he calls ninfas, and one in particular he calls Charlotte. Lessons in exophilosophy, which are cogent analyses of the concept of the extraterrestrial through 2,000 years of Western philosophy and digressions and tangents, which are exactly as the set name suggests. Supervert, in his role as the author of the text, suggests that one can read across the sets and recombine them at will. For example, if one were just interested in reading a sadistic pornographic novel, one could read only the alien sex scenes and or the methods of deterrestrialization and skip the philosophical ruminations altogether. Supervert suggests that to read like a computer is ideal. I was originally drawn to the book because of its preposterous premise, a book about a sexual fetish for aliens representing a desire for something that, as far as we know, is an impossibility. And given the impossibility of satisfying this fetish, it seemed clear that the text would devolve into deeper bowels of depravity. I felt as if this journey might be worth it to explore a topic that is certainly an oft unstated element of many UFO abduction narratives, and thus might provide some unique imaginings of gender and sexuality beyond the terrestrial. To be fair, the sections in the set uh, Lessons in Exophilosophy read incredibly well. Few authors provide such a concise pathway through the ways in which extraterrestrials have been considered in Western philosophy. Reading this set and skipping the others is worth the price of admission alone. The writing of the sections ASS and MOD, however, are repetitively repulsive insta instances of rape and sexual assault, both of Charlotte as Mercury Desaad's new nympha, or of aliens that one controls telepathically, or that one violates through climbing through hundred foot tall vulvas, or that one destroys by pulling a giant testicle out of the ground. <laughs> and that's like <laughs> the, the most mainstream of some of the things that were done. In almost all cases, Mercury decides imaginative couplings end in climax and the cum shot, the most tired form of pornography. Importantly, Mercury Desaad fails to transform himself. Playing the well-worn role of the cishet male who thinks everyone should follow his every desire, who thinks he can mold the world to his will, he forces others to do his bidding, to mutilate their body, as he breaks down Charlotte in order to transform her, impossibly it must be said, into his image of the perfect alien female. So my feelings towards these pornographic parts of the text have changed over the past few extremely challenging and infuriating months. As I have begun to embrace my transgender identity, my own rage has been rising, a rage described by Susan Stryker over 20 years ago as that, quote, bred by the necessity of existing in external conditions that work against my survival, end quote. To that end, my patience for so-called transgressions that are merely variations on cis-normative fantasies of non-consensual control, penetration, climax, and the cum shot has worn thin. Supervert acknowledges in an afterward that Mercury de Sade, as an exophile, is an unlikable and unsympathetic monomaniac, and admits that most people would find him rather monotonous. <laughs> I do wonder how he might rewrite his text today, as it was originally written in 2001, as he does suggest, tantalizingly, that perhaps Mercury de Sade himself needs to, quote, become alien. Yet I prefer these days to put these male works aside and draw from feminist and queer speculative worlds that move beyond the gender binary and that also have transformations, xenomogrifications of the characters without the sin sinister coercion of Mercury de Sade. But if we are to take Supervert at his word, he says the best way to read this book is like a computer. So a computer it is. I took the lessons in exophilosophy and methods of deterrestrialization de sets, wrote some co code that generates new sentences based on the word frequency of the, of the original text, and selected sentences to tell a new story about Charlotte. Call this the occult ability of Charlotte to fuck with the man who abused her, the underlying crypto power of the women and female aliens that Supervert as author ignores at his peril. So I call this section, Possibilities of Righteous Rage and Escape. Her fingers curl and watches for the philosophy of Jovians. Quote, it would be better without inventing an astonishingly parallel discourse concerned with my fatherland, end quote. And she gestured towards the stars. Charlotte hisses. 
Mercury de Sade is the theory posed by a French can be translated into Russian because there is a French religious newspaper. He has a face like a bucket of dirty water. Falsifiability examines the matter differently. Quote, fuck are we doing two miles away from a thinking spirit? Charlotte stirs uneasily. The body twitches and paws at so many centuries of religious obfuscation. Kids like Charlotte grow up. He hears a damp snapping sound of words. She looks bleak. Quote, it is precisely because Radio Shack stocks so many wires and switches and superfluity. She repeats, quote, beep you, I am greatly concerned with the other, end quote. He puts a wig on an empty stage. Mercury de Sade is here brought down on the filthy iron tracks. It is petite bourgeois earth and Mars. Bergson thus arrives at a point of contact. There are phantoms of logical possibility. Charlotte is getting the very principle of the flying saucer. Charlotte is something else. She smiles, pleased. She needs to be there. Yeah. Xenomogrification and speculative media. Ursula Le Guin's novel, The Left Hand of Darkness, has become part of a feminist and queer corpus of speculative fiction because of its augmented relationship to gender and sexuality, at least compared to most other works of its time. Many critics over the intervening decades have, nevertheless, questioned certain choices by Le Guin having to do with perspective, behavior, or pronoun choice. In response, Le Guin, rare for an author, regularly reflected on those choices in this novel, and while from the perspective of 2018, we still might raise issues with it as it was originally written. I agree with Tuesday, Tuesday Smilly, who has written that her reflections offer a mode of auto-critique in public. In one of these auto-critiques is Gender Necessary Redux. Le Guin writes that the book is not a utopia because it would require an, a, quote, imaginary radical change in human anatomy, end quote. Rather, and this is another quote from Le Guin, all it tries to do is open up an alternative viewpoint to widen the imagination. This imagination is to deal with the real problem, exploitation, that Le Guin's, and Le Guin continues to state that, quote, our real curse is actually alienation. More recent texts have foregrounded some of these radical changes in human anatomy from a feminist or queer perspective. Larissa Lai's Saltfish Girl weaves a tale across centuries of transmogrifications of women through spectral, cyborgian, and biotechnological means. Lai's book has been understood through a multitude of intersecting lenses having to do with race, gender, ethnicity, and the experience of the other in Canada, in addition to the post-human and cyborg. In writing about Lai and other Canadian post-feminist authors of color, Bell and Martin Lucas highlighted, quote, the trope of the skin as a permeable border, end quote, and showed how um, Lai and other authors propose, quote, fluid transgender, transsexual, transnational, transspecies, and or even transgalactic modes of what has been theorized as deterritorialized citizenship. Contra the cis white heteronormativity of supervert, we could turn to Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis trilogy, a series that engage with, engages with human alien sexuality in a more nuanced manner than an extraterrestrial sex fetish. The survivors of a nuclear war on Earth are saved by an alien race called the Onkali, master traders and genetic engineers who have three different genders, male, female, and the Uloi, who do the vast majority of the genetic engineering, and are necessary to all forms of conception and sexual activity, including cross-species. Humans are xenomogrified into Onkali human constructs so that they can move away from the so-called contradiction, namely the conflict between hierarchical behavior and creativity that the Onkali say will ultimately doom the unmodified human species to destruction. These xenomogrifications of humans into constructs occurs within what Dagmar van Enken understands as the transness of all Onkali. This occurs because the Onkali, while being divided into male, female, and Ulai genders, only take on these genders after processes of, quote, metamorphosis as transition, as Enken calls it. The constructs offer a transfuturity, in Ben Engen's words, quote, transfuturity is bound up with the non-human, with intersectional understandings of the animal world and our environmental understandings. Butler's most erotic aliens are a parable of non-human, non-binary trans life, deeply indebted to the queer possibilities and coercive legacies of Western science, end quote. Last section, xenomogrification as disalienation. Transmogrification, to alter a change in form or appearance, to transform, metamorphose, utterly, grotesquely, or strangely, to astonish, utterly, confound. 
De Forti and John Keel, author of the Mothman Pro Prophecies, wrote a text in 1969 for the Flying Saucer Review entitled The Principle of Transmogrification. Yeah. In this text, Keel argues that the sightings of so-called hard UFOs, such as metallic flying saucers, play merely a diversionary role, and that <laughs> UFOologists should focus instead on the soft sightings of, quote, transparent or translucent objects seemingly capable of altering their size and shape dramatically, end quote. These transmogrified objects, while shifting, are in fact more uniform in behavior and appearance than the wide variety of objects called hard UFOs. David Sheffield, a curator for the National Archives UFO Project in the UK, has written that Keel believed that the extraterrestrials on these soft craft were, quote, shape-shifting spiritual entities. Keel attempted to conjoin the study of extraterrestrials and demonology through his research and the use of the word transmogrification. We can also think of that word in a different sense. In a recent text entitled Transmogrification, Unbecoming Others about body modification practices, including those undertaken by trans people, Nikki Sullivan wrote that, quote, we, that we ask ourselves whether, in one sense at least, all of these forms of embodiment could be said to constitute and be constituted by transmogrification. That is a process of unbecoming strange and or grotesque of unbecoming. I want to work from these definitions to offer up a different notion through the transformation of transmogrification into xenomogrification and ask us to think as and ask us to begin to think about xenomogrification as disalienation. I'm thinking here of the term disalienation in the Marxist sense, in the sense Franz Fanon was thinking of it in Black Skin White Masks, in the way Kodo Eshun writes that, quote, the condition of alienation is a psychosocial inevitability that all Afro-diasporic art uses to its own advantage by creating contexts that encourage a process of disalienation, end quote. In analyzing um, Ursula Le Guin's novel, The Dispossessed, Tim Libretti writes that Le Guin imagines the possibility of a, quote, culture that fosters the impulse to mutual aid that will most effectively optimize and connect people with, that is, disalienate them from their creative human natures. Importantly, Libretti notes that for both Marx and Le Guin, uh, work in a society of disalienated existence is, quote, the means by which the primary erotic desire of creativity, which is not limited to genital sexuality, is satisfied. That is, work is a satisfying expression of the fundamental human erotic desire and of the primary and definitive drive of human nature, end quote. And so this is where I depart from Laboria Kubanix's call for a politics of alienation in the Xenofeminist Manifesto. I want to stress instead the importance of grabbing onto disalienation as a means to recapture and redirect the narrative. Our societies are alienated enough as it is, given the xenophobia that is infecting societies the world over. But by calling for disalienation, I do not wish to imply that there is some endpoint named unalienated existence, of course. No. Rather, I see disalienation as a process, an attractor that guides and pulls at me and you without entirely determining my path. Disalienation does not mean primitivism or return to an impossible Edenic state, far from it. In fact, as I've hopefully began to show today, processes of xenomogrification are necessary, vital, life-affirming technological practices that allow people to move away from an alienated existence. Yet I want to acknowledge a few things. In a lecture from 1996, Sadie Plant said that, quote, people don't really want to become deterritorialized flows of matter. She has a point. <laughs> for all of the aestheticization of our Todian bodies without organs, and I'm guilty of that for sure, I contend that many of us would prefer to hold some structure to our matter. We will fight to hold structure in a world that often denies our existence. And no, xenomogrification does not imply that we become deterritorialized flows of matter. But, but perhaps supervert has use after all. Mercury Desaad terms his transformation of Charlotte as a process of deterrestrialization, and I think that neologism has some use as an attractor of itself, divorced, of course, from the problematic context of the novel. In order to both live on our changing planet, as well as exist amongst the vastness of space, we will likely require radical modifications of our bodies that move away from what we currently know as the terrestrial towards the extraterrestrial. And it should go without saying that the possibility of these modifications absolutely must be evenly distributed. But I also want to note that xenomogrification is not guaranteed to be pain-free. In fact, it's likely to be extremely painful, 
Tears will be shed. Friends and family may shun you. You may question your own choices at times. And perhaps this is also in part what Sadie Plant was trying to get at, and what drives so much hatred these days, fear. These sorts of xenomogrifications are challenging, challenging not only be, be, to the boundaries dearly held by conservative forces, but challenging also to those on the fence about whether the transformations are worth it. Let me say from my perspective that they are. But to dismiss the fear impulse is to ignore the need to have some sort of stable point to grab onto as we are all pulled towards the attractors of xenomogrification. We can make it, though, through mutual aid, and as we are flung towards a new attractor that is beyond our perception, we know that our singular trajectories are nevertheless shared in solidarity. Thank you. Oh, thank you.